didn't do anything. There oh, there it is. Hey guys, welcome to the first episode of the Dad Bot Two Fit Podcast. Today I have Sam and Seth with me. We're going to be going over a bunch of questions that we've had on Facebook and YouTube. So, Seth, you want to do a quick disclaimer, please? Hey, what's up, guys? How's it going? I hope everyone's doing good today. Um, you guys already know the routine. We're not doctors or anything like that, whatsoever. So don't take this as any medical advice. This is just for entertainment purposes only. Um, so let's get this show started here. Well, so the goal of this is really we're going to do like an hour-long podcast where we're just going through a, as many questions as we can. And then later on, we're going to break this down to individual videos and label those by the questions. So if you guys are looking for a specific question down the road, instead of having to comb through this entire episode, you can just go back and find the individual video. So both will be available on our YouTubes and Facebook, etc. So, All right, well, let's hop into this. So this will be good. <laughs> All right, so this is a question I got on my YouTube channel. So please do one on how I can use to gain muscle but would not show up on – oh, sorry. Please do one on something I can use that would not show up on a multinational corporation drug test. So this is a good question. Um, I think SARMs for a long time were the answer, right, because nobody had a test that could find a SARM in your labs. Um, and so that was a good solution for a long time, but now some companies are coming out with – different tests where they can actually pick up the use of SARMs. Sam, you got anything to add to that? So um, <clears throat> please do one uh, gaining muscle. So SARMs are not going to show up on drug tests unless you're like specifically testing for them. Same thing with even testosterone or DECA or like steroids or peptides, right? They're not going to show up on a drug test because when you look at a traditional drug test from like a big number, multinational company, it's going to test for THC, it's going to test for opioids, it's going to test for heroin, it's going to test for painkillers, and all those types of things, but it's not testing for PEDs on a, on a physical sense or PEDs, um, well, I don't know if it tests for uh, like Adderall, if that would be like an amphetamine or not, but definitely not going to test for test, uh, testosterone or steroids. So some things that you could take is any fucking steroid or any SARM or any peptide because that shit's not going to show up. That doesn't mean you should do it. And that doesn't mean there's not going to be other consequences to it, but they're it's not going to show up on a drug test. Right. So this is a good question because <clears throat> like you got I get it a lot from military guys. You know, what can I take while I'm in the military? It's not going to show up on test. I'm not condoning the use of anything illegal. Right. But obviously while I was in the military, I was taking stuff too. Um, they're not going to test for an anabolic steroid, like what Sam was saying, unless there's a reason to do so generally speaking. Right. So a lot of guys in my unit are like, dude, you're taking something, right? And I was taking super draw back then, gaining muscle really fast. They're like, obviously, you're juicing. I was like, yeah, so what? You know, and uh, they wouldn't, they didn't even bother to test me. But if I had gotten into a fight or something, they would have because there were guys who were juicing that did get into fights and they did get tested and they did get busted. So it really depends on the corporation or the entity that you're working for because, like Sam said, they're not generally going to include anything anabolic on a test. I think um, so unless mostly, you give them a reason to, they're not going to worry about it. I think they mostly just test for like what Sam said, narcotics and stuff right. like that. Um, they they really don't look for these type of things. Like, I mean, there's no purpose to. <laughs> it's just going to be a waste of a test, pretty much. <laughs> but you, even in the military, like your your superiors can know that you're taking something, and and they are not going to, you know test 97 percent of the time i'm not going to test for it unless you're doing something stupid like what brian was saying like right if you're you know fucking around or fucking shit up or fucking other people up then they'll say something and then they'll get you tested right because then they can you know have uh you know, consequences to that but if they're if you're just doing like being the best person you can be every day and like they don't give a shit about that so right. tell me tell me tell me this though like brian probably you probably would know for people who are on like you know treatments and like testosterone therapy would they test for things like that like you know like would it be the same thing or basically i mean it would it'd fall into the same category so um if they're going to run an anabolic steroid test then yes it would show the use of testosterone however however if you're at a trt dosage it's not going to show at a level that's super physiological right so it's not so likely that there's going to be an issue with it um 
if you're running, let's say, Anadrol or something and Decadurabol or something like that for, you know, six months at a time getting fights, that's when the test is going to come about. And as far as the military goes, I don't know how it is nowadays, but back in my day, as long as you kept your mouth shut and didn't get in any trouble, there wasn't ever an issue, right? So I can't speak to as to how the military is nowadays. Um, I know things have changed a lot in the last 15 years or however long it's been since I got out. So um, do you, do you, um, you want to touch on this question before we get more into the slides real quick? Pierre uh, Eth asks, I was always fascinated by HGH. Seemed like the Holy Grail. Once I tried it, just bloated me the fuck out. Now I'm more into HGH frag. Thoughts. So I have some thoughts on that, but let's go Brian first, and then I can get into it after you guys. So this, this is kind of funny because – um, when the whole liver king thing came out, I was like, there's no way he's taking that much growth hormone and looks that good. Right. Because for most guys taking a high dose of HGH. Now it's not true for everybody across the board, right? There's always a variable in there, no matter what we're talking about. But for most guys taking a super high level of HGH, they're going to look very bloated, like the retaining water, et cetera. Now, a lot of guys, even like in the question are taking probably a fairly low dose of HGH and still getting that bloated look. Right. Um, I just thought that was kind of funny that Liver King said he was taking so much and he looks so cut and dry and hard. And that's kind of why I called BS on that. Yeah. Um, I would ask like how much he was taking because I only did HGH for a very short period of time, like not long enough to like, I didn't notice it at all in the short, like maybe like two weeks or something like that. That I ended up taking, but I'm taking peptides a bunch. Um, I'm taking, I just started researching with AOD 9604, which is like, uh, frag hgh 2.0 kind of thing with a longer half-life and stuff uh and i don't notice any bloating in my opinion right because people say bloating with mk677 as well which is a secreted guy for hgh uh people say that you gain a lot of fluid or puffiness or whatever i've never noticed that i've never had that issue i've taken uh epimorland cjc mk677 hexarellin i've done multiple times and i've gone pretty high in the dosage with hexarellin. I'm doing AOD 9604. I don't notice any like increase in puffiness. I think most of that in all honesty comes from poor diet. Personally, that's my opinion because I take large amounts of MK677, no issues, right? Now I haven't, I haven't tested the HGH at like 10 IU or 12 IU a day, right? Maybe that might be different, but I just don't see I don't, I don't, I, I mean, I want to try HGH. I'll try four, like two IU, four IU and six IU and see if I know it's a difference at some point, but I don't, I've never noticed the, the bloating. So of it. I want to chime in here a little bit. I've, I've researched it with, for a bunch of different times and I've gone up in dosages and lower dosages and higher dosages. And I've had a little bit of water retention when it goes up past like three IU. <laughs> I, the first time I ever, researched with it i didn't know how to do it like anything like dosage wise so i kind of fucked up and i went higher and i was like why am i fucking bloated like you know why what's going on i got water retention so i think the higher the dosages some people might retain it depends on the person maybe um i mean but i think what sam is saying he nailed it spot on is partly your diet so it depends on what type of foods you intake if you're eating shit foods, going out, fast foods, processed foods, certain carbs and stuff like that. I think it really does matter. And if you're not drinking enough water as well. Yeah, I think diet is largely a part of it, obviously. I think specifically carbs and sodium would be the, the main factors as far as a bloat goes if it's diet related. Uh, when it came to uh, the, the different compounds that stimulate growth hormone or that are growth hormone, let's say peptides or whatever, the only one I had bloating issues from was MK677, and I tried it a couple of different times. And it's kind of interesting because if I use a topical version, um, I didn't have an issue. And um, I only had an issue. Let's see, I, I'd have to go back and look at my notes. But I was eating really clean when I was taking it, and I did get bloating still. So it, it's kind of interesting how people react differently. I, I, I think another factor that can play into the bloating is – uh, body fat percentage. So I talked to this guy on, on, on Facebook and he uh, was like, Hey, he'd never tried MK67. So he's tried a bunch of other shit, but he's never tried MK677. 
He's like, is it true that bloating? And I'm like, no, like I don't get it at all. Uh, but I think the biggest factor is the diet. And the reason I say that it could be the body fat percentage is because I, I probably said 10 to 12 percent ish, 13. I don't know, in that range for body fat percentage. Not that that's high or low or anything. But what I have noticed is that people who are a higher body fat percentage than me are the ones that I've talked to that said there is bloating. So when this dude, he's lower body fat percentage than me, and he was like, dude, you're right. Like, I don't get any, right? And he's lower body fat percentage than me. And he's like, I don't get any bloating at all with MK677. Uh, he still looks really tight, really good. So I wonder how much interplay there has with body fat percentage, right? Like, say me below 15% body fat, you notice that a lot less. But with, you know, above 15% body fat, you're going to notice more and more of the bloating effect of it or whatever, potentially. Yeah, I think that's true. And I think that goes back to the, the carbs, right? Um, I've noticed that before, whether or not I'm on any other product, if I'm kind of carb depleted and eating clean, and then I have a day where I go out and pick out and spaghetti, right? The next day I look like I'm wet, bloated. Same kind of look as with MK677 that I had. Here's, in the a, past. here's another question, guys. I mean, this retain, does 4 Andrew retain water like when you're taking you know, obviously taking for andro but i think that goes back to what we're talking about it's your diet like that really matters so guys like if you're taking a product and your diet's not clean like you're just going to retain a whole bunch of water or something else is off in your um system and which should be getting blood check and who knows you know now, I will say on the 4Andro that I do believe that there's some kind of conversion there because a lot of the companies claim that 4Andro cannot or does not convert to estrogen. Uh, that being said, assuming that it cannot ever possibly become estrogen, I think that possibly what's happening in some guys is that they're taking the 4Andro, it's converting to testosterone, right? Just to make it simplified. But their body's still going to be producing some testosterone. And since their body has enough testosterone from the four andro, some of the natural production of testosterone is being converted into a higher level of estrogen. Now, your body's supposed to have a ratio of testosterone to estrogen that's balanced, right? Um, and if it can get if it gets out of balance, that's when you can have the estrogen side effects, and one of those would be water retention, right? So there is a possibility that yes, on your four andro, especially at a higher dose, you could have higher estrogen levels that would result in the blood. I actually, I'm sorry. Go ahead. I was just going to say, that being said, most people in the industry that sell for Andro won't say that. They say it can't convert, right? But I have actually played with it enough that I have noticed that myself. Take an AI or a CERM and knock out that bloating real quick. I'm not it, saying it, that's what the problem is. You need to do a lap. It can 100% convert. Your, yeah, yeah. 100% convert. Though the one Andro won't, but like the four Andro is 100% convert. If you look at like how I just was looking through the piece of paper because I literally threw it out yesterday or two days ago, but there's a, you know, you got cholesterol and that turns into something else. And then there's androstene dial one or something like that. And for andro is like this that converts into DHEA, which converts into testosterone or something along these lines. And then testosterone, if it's converting into testosterone, not one testosterone, then it can definitely convert into estrogen or multiple different forms of estrogen, which then also can have an effect on the bloatingness or the feeling of water retention. Like just this week, uh, I was like, oh, I look slightly soft, right? Uh, and these are subtle things that, that you, the individual might notice, but like the rest of the planet will not notice any difference in your physique. And so I was like, okay, let me add in, I hadn't taken any anastrozole. So I was like, okay, cool. Let me add in a little bit of anastrozole. Maybe, the, maybe I have a little bit too much estrogen without actually checking so i tested this and then I immediately like within 24 hours the next morning when i woke up and looked in the mirror i was leaner i was just leaner you look leaner not that you less look necessarily dropped any body fat but the subcutaneous water that's you got the muscle and then the, the fat on top of there and in that layer like if you have extra water in there you're going to look fatter you're going to look like you're more um bloated or soft or whatever the case is yeah, for sure. Um, that being said, I think guys like always need to be getting labs done because if you're going to take an AI or whatever to lower the estrogen levels in uh, a reaction to the bloating, 
you got to be careful you don't drop them too low because then you can also kick into other side effects like ED, you know, dry joints, uh, bone loss, not being able to build muscle, et cetera. So there's a very fine line there. Brian, question for you on this. Um, so sometimes, maybe five months ago, four months ago, I switched from like 225 milligrams of testosterone a week, which I've been on for probably around two years to 270 milligrams of testosterone. But in that switch, I stopped with SARMs and anything other uh, anabolic, right? I think I've made, uh, John, like in the last four months, I've, I've used Anabar maybe like once. And uh, I think I used SARMs on one day too. So there's been like two days where I used something over the past four months, but it's been testosterone at 270 milligrams. So I felt great. My workouts are absolutely stunning, but I think that has more to do with the mental piece of things. Um, because I've just been putting more effort and focus in there. Now, every once in a while, I'll take an AI because I have a slightly higher uh, testosterone. And one of the things that I notice is that when I add in the AI, I, I use anastrozole, I will notice an increase in erections like almost immediately. Like, but then that night, I'll wake up and I'll be like fucking hard in the middle of the night or, or wake up in the morning hard, where when I don't do that, Sometimes I don't like, I won't notice it, but then like immediately after I take the AI, I'll notice that in the middle of the night or in the first thing in the morning. Is that, do you also notice that? Yeah, I've noticed that too. Uh, that does go back into what I was saying though, as far as if you keep taking the AI at too high a dose for too long, then you have the opposite effect. So I've experienced exactly the same thing as you, Sam, and then continued the AI thinking, oh my God, this is great, right? And then all of a sudden, boom, I got issues. Quit taking the AI and a few days later, everything comes back to normal. And that's obviously a redneck way of doing it because I'm not doing a lab every single day to track exactly what's going on. But this is something that I've repeated enough times to know how it's how I'm reacting. Right. I think it, I think it kind of resets your your androgen or not androgen system, something with your testosterone levels or something like that by adding that AI in to lower the estrogen. So I don't know. Maybe it balances everything out somehow. <laughs> I think what it's doing is lowering the ratio of estrogen to testosterone. So your body all of a sudden has a big spike in testosterone and a lower natural range type estrogen level. So all of a sudden you have a bunch of free testosterone that can be converted back into, you know, better libido, whatever else. And you could be in, because we're not like checking, like we might make changes like you know, on a weekly basis to the, some of the stuff, I'm not saying anybody else should, or you should do any of the things that we talk about, right. We're not fucking doctors, but making these changes on a regular basis, even if we get blood work, say every four months or six months, it's just like we're making 26 changes in that six month period of time before getting blood work again. And so like, you kind of like play with these things and you're working with them. Uh, one of the things, and then we can get back into some of those, those questions. One of the things that, and I wanted to ask Brian about this too, because he has kids and, and Seth and I do not have kids. Um, I don't know if it was Huberman or some other doctor that I follow uh, said that when women are going through pregnancy, men have an increase in, I believe it was uh, prolactin. No, pro, yeah, yeah, prolactin. I believe it was I think men have an increase in prolactin. Uh, so prolactin, right, sex drive, sexual function, the ability to ejaculate or come, right, or some of the things associated with prolactin. You, you have multiple kids. I don't know if you tested that shit during that time period, but if you did, let me know. But if not, what do you think of, of that? Or did you notice looking back on it, be like, oh, I did have it. Maybe I did have an increase in estri or prolactin while I had a decrease in sex drive or a decrease in the sensitivity to be able to come or whatever the case is. Do you remember? <laughs> so... That's kind of funny you brought that up. So back in the day when I was taking Superdrol all the time, I've talked before in other videos about how Superdrol causes a spike in prolactin, usually post-cycle about two weeks, right? And that's what caused my gynecomastia. So it's kind of interesting that – so I did have a fourth child. My first child was a daughter. She died right after birth. Her mom got preeclampsia, and she was full term. And uh, basically the, the infection got to the baby, and it crushed her lungs. And uh, so I've had – four kids right and uh three of the four were conceived in conjunction with taking super draw <laughs> so i was i was experiencing the side effects of the higher prolactin like the sensitive itchy nipples um even in some cases lactating and all three of those conceptions were on birth control so <laughs> interesting uh interesting yeah. 
that's I, I apologize we're gonna get into those i just took a sperm test um and basically like it comes back as negative which means you're below like what is the normal level um for for the uh, sperm test but then i'm thinking about this from the prolactin or estrogen right because they can both cause gynecomastia right and a lot of the times if i do take an ai now that i'm at a slightly higher dose i do take it not every week but like maybe every other week or something i will also add in vitamin b6 because i guess you know vitamin b6 can also lower prolactin levels so what i'll do is i'll stack those two together if i'm going to take an ai most of the time i'll also take vitamin b6 at like 100 milligrams, but I'll set up, excuse me, I'll set up two more capsules because there's like research that they compared it with cabergoline and to lower prolactin. And it was very effective, similar to prolactin or similar to cabergoline, but you just don't have the drug. This is something you can buy at the store for six bucks, right? Uh, so utilizing that in conjunction with this, and I wonder if it is the AI that's causing me to get the erections or the prolactin, or just the combination of the two of those. Because not the way that we were talking about the prolactin. It could largely be a combination of the two. Um, that, that being said, going back to B6, though, and prolactin levels, I've tried B6 before when I was having issues with high prolactin levels, and I think it's something that you've got to start taking beforehand and take it for quite a while before it actually has the same effect as Kaber, right? So in the past, I tried B6. That wasn't doing anything, so I popped it a small dose of caber and boom, the side effects were gone like two days later. Right. Well, question for you. How were you taking the B6? The capsule form, like the liquid caps. Once a day? Uh, twice a day. Do you, do you remember how many milligrams it was? I don't. It was a pretty high dose. I read that same research and dug through okay. there pretty good. I was on the higher end and I was doing at least, I think some days I even did three doses a day. So. In interesting. I, I would like to get that. I would like to do more, blood work and tests yeah. or whatever, so. so we can check this stuff because it's it's fascinating to us and hopefully it's interesting you guys want to go to the next sure. uh, yep. question here you want to go to this next question down here on the comments oh go ahead pull it up uh, <laughs> daryl e is 20 milligrams of ostring the sweet spot you guys uh, I, I would say like it's pretty much on the type of person like everyone has their own sweet spot so it's like more dose dependent on anything so like if i have a, a dose that's you know different than yours it might be lower or higher you just gotta kind of experiment on your own self like you know dosages and stuff like that because the one like if brian has a higher dose and i have a different dose or we have the same dose one might not work the same way for that person like that's that's my opinion Cool. What do you what do you what do you think of Brian? Uh, do think? I agree with that. I, I think that it's um, it depends on what somebody's goal is, as well. Because if my goal is to put on a tremendous amount of muscle, um, and I'm using osterine as the anabolic, um, it might be too low of a dose for me. Like I've done as high as 50 milligrams a day of osterine, and I. I felt like I noticed a big difference between 20 milligrams and 50 milligrams a day, right? So if my goal is to gain the most amount of muscle as possible, yes, we're all going to respond differently. Completely agree with that shit, 100%. But if my goal was to gain as much muscle as possible and I'm using, say, testosterone base and then osterine as like the primary anabolic, maybe a higher dose than that is appropriate. Whereas if mine is maybe like to maintain where I'm at, maybe five milligrams is the sweet spot, right? So I think that it's really predicated on that, like seesaw, like what your goal is, right? What are you, what are you trying to accomplish? Because maybe five milligrams is perfect if you're just trying to maintain what you're doing. You're on a low dose of TRT and you just want that tiny little bit extra as a pre-workout. Cool, five milligrams might be like the perfect sweet spot for you. Uh, but I do see the 20 mg is like the most common dose that people uh, talk about at least. I will throw in there, though, that I think a lot of times, um, since there's a lack of research on SARM specifically, it's hard to know the ultimate length of time for a cycle. And so, yes, you have to take your goals into consideration, but also the length of time that you're expecting to accomplish those goals. Right. So this is not advice on how to use these things. But if, you know, looking at it from 
uh, my own past experience kind of perspective. I think that if you were going to say, you know, I want to get fit over the next year, you know, instead of doing a whole bunch of eight week cycles to get there, maybe take a lower dose and do it nonstop the entire there. And I'm not saying you should do this, but with a SARM, I think that it is practical or possible, especially with a lower dose of, let's say, Osterine, maybe 10 or 15 milligrams per day, you'd accomplish more over that year period with a longer, lower dose than with a higher dose over multiple short cycles. And, and, and just to like, cause I completely agree uh, to like, you're like, okay, cool. That kind of makes sense. But then sometimes things will make sense, but it's easier for people to grasp them when you tie them into things that they can know about. Right. So if, if you think about this for a second, if you take say the next month and you put in 40 additional hours per week, to whatever it is that you're trying to accomplish in your life that's important for you versus you take an hour or two hours a day every day for a whole year, which one's going to make you more progress? The year, because you're going to, it's just, you're developing at a different rate. You, your consistency right. over time is what really, really makes a big difference. So here, here's another question, guys. So um, John is asking, what is the longest possible time you would feel safe to take MK677? I've got some good ones. That's, that's a good one for right. you, Sam. Okay, so so uh, John, what's good, bro? Um, MK677 has already been tested in fragile human beings, people above 55 years old. Just kidding, they're not necessarily fragile, but on older people, right? It was either 55 or 65 years old for two years. So they've already put it in humans for multiple years without any side effects. The, the, the most common side effects from the research that I've looked at were related to a transitory effect on hunger, right? Because MK677 is a ghrelin agonist. So ghrelin is your hunger hormone, right? So, but it's transitory. That just means it comes and goes, right? So in the initial beginning portions of it, there was a, maybe for one or two months for some of the population who was studied, they had an increase in hunger where that wore off after a couple months. The other thing to pay attention to, but they didn't, and, and people like, I think are scared of this, a lot more than should be based upon like reality. If you look at the data and these people are pro probably not super metabolically healthy, meaning having a very high insulin sensitivity, uh, super active, low blood sugar levels, low blood uh, pressure levels, right? Like the groups that they were studied didn't even have that much of an effect on your blood sugar levels or insulin sensitivity. So people are like, oh my God, I don't want diabetes, MK677, bad, right? But they'll take a SARM that crushes their fucking natural testosterone levels and, and not be cognizant to the fact that like MK677 in people who are, they're humans, right? So you don't have to worry about extrapolating from a rat or like a Petri dish, right, in in vivo. But these are actual humans that are probably in worse shape, probably have higher blood sugar levels, lower insulin sensitivity, and potentially higher blood pressure. And it didn't even have a substantial enough effect for them to stop the study, right? If it was that big of an impact, they would have stopped the study. They'd be like, oh shit, 36% of the population who's taking MK677 every single day, we need to stop this study because 36% of them have high blood sugar levels that we don't, that are getting into the dangerous category and or their insulin sensitivity is, is uh, decreasing at such a rapid rate, like that's not a good thing. And that didn't happen. And yet so many people are freaking scared of MK677 because like, I don't even know, there's like myth out there that is completely detrimental to your blood sugar. Levels. So, so I think, think go, ahead. go ahead. I was going to say, I think a lot of that comes from other YouTubers. There's one specifically that I'm thinking of, I'm not going to name who took a very high dose for a long time and messed up his insulin levels, right? And I think uh, Seth, you know who I'm talking about. So um, do you think that there's a correlation between dose and duration? I think obviously there would be, right? But what do you think would be a practical uh, way of looking at this? Should, should, if somebody's going to go for two years, should they do it every single day right before bed? Or should they do it like a smaller dose on workout days? Or what would be kind of the optimal in your opinion, Sam? So like... I did it for 14 months straight. So uh, I had an issue with my elbow. I wanted to heal my elbow. So I did it for 14 months straight. Now, during that 14 months, I experimented with timing, whether it was in the morning, midday, evening. I experimented with split dosing throughout the day. I experimented with mega dosing. Like at any one of those points, I experimented with 
like a every other day. I experimented with five days off, two days off. I experimented with the plethora of different like administration, timing, dosing, all of that stuff over the course of 14 months. To the one point, there was a probably like a six week period of time where Monday through Friday, I did hexarelin, and then Saturday and Sunday, I did MK677. MK They're both ghrelin agonists, but they work, they're just two different compounds. One's injected and one's uh, oral on there. And what I would say is like, what's the safest way to do this? And the most effective way without having a negative impact on your like metabolic health, like your blood sugar and insulin sensitivity, um, would be to measure it, right? Like measure that shit and then some common sense type things that you can do is think about what negatively impacts your blood sugar levels, processed carbohydrates, sugars, all that garbage. So maybe you should eat that shit, right? It also is associated with like inflammation in your body and a thousand other things, right? So decreasing the things that cause that shit to go up, right? That's probably a good idea. You're like, okay, wait, MK677 for people who don't live like a metabolically healthy life, who eat a lot of processed carbohydrates, who are not very active, right? And you're like, okay, I see my um, uh, H, what is it? HBA1C is elevated relative to three months ago for the MK677. And they're like, oh, I should stop taking MK677. That's the first thought they have. Not that they should change their effing diet because their diet's garbage, right? Like, right. Right? It's just like common sense. Like, so check checking your HBA1C, uh, I think is super intelligent. Berberine, 500 milligrams when you have a carbohydrate meal. Like I just finished eating my meal. I had steak, eggs, and bacon. I have There's going to be no effect on my insulin sensitivity because I'm not eating carbohydrates, right? So there's not going to have an effect with the fat or the protein on there. If you're having a carbohydrate meal, and a lot of people have them every single meal, you can decrease your carbohydrate intake. You can do carbohydrate. You can add in berberine, 500 milligrams per meal, right? Like if you have carb meals and they tend to be the evening meal, cool. And have berberine with that um, increasing activity. Like if you go for a three minute walk, yeah, uh, like now, just increase it to 10 minutes. And every single day, go for a 10 minute walk. Like be in the state of being present because that'll help with other things in your life. But that also help with your blood sugar. Yeah, I like to usually do walks right after my meal. So like. I, like Sam said, I'll do 10, 15 minutes walk, a walk. Like I'll go walk my dogs or something. Like if you have a dog or even just go, like it will help move around your food and your system and shuttle those carbs out quicker. So like there's so many ways you can do it. Good, good point. That's also a really good habit to be into. Seth. That's a really yeah. good habit. Yeah. Overall eating healthier is the biggest problem in fitness. I was watching a really good video. I think it was on TikTok the other night where mm -hmm. they were talking about, um, <clears throat> you know, you look at a guy's physique. Actually, I think I shared this on my Instagram last night um, on the story. It was, what is that actor's name? A real big, bald guy, tattooed neck. Um, anyway, uh, he was talking about how, um, maybe that's the wrong guy. Anyway, talking about how diet is so big a factor in fitness, right? You look at a guy's physique and you're like, oh, he's got the ultimate physique. He's got to be taking gear. And it's more likely, no, his diet's been dialed in for years on end. Right. So blaming stuff on PEDs, I think, is uh, not the issue most of the time. The PED is secondary to the diet. And a lot of times the diet is what is causing an issue in relation to the PED. That's a really good point. Like uh, I'm, as I mentioned, I'm like, you know, 10 to 13 ish percent body fat, I would guess. I don't know. But like a lot of people that I see or that I talk to about gear, think that I'm taking substantially more than I'm taking. But it's to Brian's point, because I'm just focused on the diet piece of things a little bit more than a lot of people are for a longer period of time. That's a great, great, great point. Because it's like, that's that's like the actual PED of like life or like fitness or health or whatever. Like, like improve your diet. And like all the other factors are just like, oh, wow, I, I made progress with my testosterone. I made progress with my fat loss. I made progress with my strength. I made progress with my gut. I made progress with my nutrient absorption. I made progress with all these other things in your life. And you're like, all you got to do is change your diet. And like all of my sleep improves. Like, you know what I mean? Like all that shit is impacted by your diet. Like you're constantly getting rashes. You're constantly, yeah. you know, go ahead. I, I was going to say, I think everyone lacks that for the most part, because I hear this around like all the time. You're like, I, I feel off or like, just like Sam said, like, you know, you 
feel lethargic or whatever. Like it, it's mainly probably not from the PED you're taking or the SARM or whatever related. It could be slightly, but it could be from your diet. So like it yeah. all plays together. Think think about it this way too. And I kind of just thought of this analogy. Maybe it'll help people think of things in a little bit of perspective in regards to diet. If you look at the human body and what it's made up of, right, it's mostly water. And then as far as muscle goes, there's a lot of amino acids involved in the building of and retention of muscle, right? Protein, amino acids, nitrogen, all that stuff plays into muscle. So can anybody name a PED that is water, amino acid, protein, nitrogen? Like those things, the PEDs help with the retention of those minerals, nutrients, et cetera but they aren't that mineral nutrient, et cetera, whatever, right? Like you can't just take a PED that's going to f- enhance the rate of building and improving and feeding the muscle. If there isn't something for it to utilize in feeding and building that muscle. That's a great, that's a great point. So if I have like a, a hammer nails and two by fours and, and you have some twigs and like some rope, like who gets to build a better cabin, right? I do. Because you got some twigs and a fucking rope, and that's like people's diet most of the time. It's just crap processed stuff. There's no tools there to actually utilize to build a cabin. And I've got hammer, I've got nails, and I've got wood, and I can build this shit. And you can't because you're just eating processed garbage, like crap or whatever. But uh, I think it's a good conversation. Hopefully, this is helpful to you guys. You want to go on to the. Yeah, yeah. If you guys have questions, leave them in the chat. Or jump, uh, jump down and follow us on other socials. I think, Sam, this is one you got on your channel. If someone has taken VPC-157, 250 micrograms per day, uh, two times a day, and TB-500, frag-1723 of thymosin B4, four milligrams to two X a week uh, for shoulder surgery. I can't even talk this morning. For shoulder surgery recovery, what duration would be the best to run it? Is there a point of diminishing returns and or hard stop for that safety? Uh, I'll go first in this one, I guess. So uh, Chad um, mentions that taking BPC plus TB500, and he gives 500 micrograms per, excuse me, 500 micrograms per day of BPC is split into two doses. TB500. Um, which is related to thymus and beta four. That's right. I think he mentions that there. Um, at need that back was up. it two two milligrams per day or was it four? Four milligrams. Four milligrams twice per week. Okay, so if you think about the dosages he's doing, and then we'll get into the last part of what he said: diminishing returns into a hard stop on the safety. Okay, TB five hundred is a massive dose compared to what I normally personally utilize or people that I've talked to, uh, Brian or South, I don't know what you guys are used to, but I take one milligram per week. And a lot of people I know utilize one milligram of TB500 per week. Now he says for shoulder surgery. So he might want to take a mega dose of this during the duration of like recovery of TB500. So he's got a shitload of it in his system. But then my question would be like, well, that might be an intelligent strategy. Why not take the same strategy with BPC, BPC, 157 and do one milligram a day instead of 500 micrograms per day, right? Um, I, I do something similar to Sam does. I do it weekly, but like, you know, this guy's depending on what his injury is like. So he has a shoulder injury. Maybe he would do it a little bit like twice a day daily for a while. And then after a little while, after it starts healing, then gradually go to once a week. So like, then you could just do, you know, was it 500 mcg a week that's basically what he's doing right now it's just split up twice a day so like he can kind of like gradually get into that um strategy depending on how fast he heals especially since he's adding in tb 500 as well and then he's like what duration is best to run of that i mean like um if you were like hey i need to go to the gas station you'd be like when should i stop driving i'd be like when you get to the gas station like, I'm not trying to be a dick, but, like, it's pretty fucking simple. If your shit is healed, right, maybe you want to go for a tiny bit after that, potentially. But, like, I would go until my shit's healed, <laughs> right? Like, I'm not I'm not trying to be a dick or anything, but, like, you're going to stop when you get to the gas station because you've reached your goal. Um, so when your shit is healed, I would stop. Or there's, there's, like, the safety, right, or diminishing returns in the long run. 
I personally plan on utilizing BPC, TB500, and something for HGH. Currently, it's CJC. Uh, and while I'm also testing out the fret, uh, like uh, AOD 9604, but I'm testing this out for the whole year. There's, I haven't seen like any negative effects of BPC at all. I, I don't talk to anybody that has, and anybody that I've seen that had, they're like, oh, I have this horrible negative side effect from BPC. Uh, you have a conversation with them and you're like, okay, well, it's probably not BPC you're taking, right? Because they're, they're having this like very strange thing that like, you would see popping up on a regular basis, given how long I've been paying attention to BPC. So like, you don't have to stop. You could just continue to run it for a while here. Here's a good one uh, question here. I don't know if anyone, you guys want to answer this one. Maybe so. Yeah. Before we get into that though, I want to bounce back to you, Sam. So back to that question, if you were going to design the ultimate recovery formula for somebody recovering from surgery, let's say knee surgery or shoulder surgery, whatever. And you could combine any peptides, MK6 and 7 growth hormone, whatever you wanted. What would you, and obviously this isn't a recommendation for people to be using this stuff, but in a response to this question, what would be probably the optimal combination and dosing type protocol? So say I'm going to, I'm going to have to have surgery at some point, right? I have, I've got a hernia. Uh, that I'm going to probably get taken care of at this point, at some point this year. So how I personally am going to approach this, right? Cause I'm not saying we're like, as we mentioned a thousand times, this is not a recommendation, but how I'm going to approach this is utilizing BPC, TB 500. I'm going to use something that has a, there's, there's two different ways you can hit HGH. Well, there's multiple different ways you can hit HGH, but let's talk about it from a peptide standpoint. You can go through the, uh, hypothalamus to pituitary axis, right? There's a GHRH. So you can get a, a something, whether it's CJC, tesamorelin, sermorelin. These are all ag these are all like analogs or partial analogs or copies of that signal versus things like epimorelin, hexorelin, MK677. These are the other way to hit HGH and they're ghrelin agonists. So I'm going to use uh, one that is the GHRH analog as well as something for the ghrelin agonist on top of tv uh bpc uh for healing and i'm if when i go through and do this i'm also going to test ghkcu um i, I would like i honestly would like more data on the ghkcu but how i would how i'm going to do this say if my surgery is on the 10th of a month I'm going to start ramping up the dosages of all these things probably three days to five days in advance in my system so that I have the elevated levels for the recovery. Because if you look at the studies on BPC, it's incredibly quick how it interacts. Now, I haven't necessarily seen this with TB uh, or, you know, things for HGH. We just know it elevates HGH, right? But if BPC has been shown to have a positive effect in less than 24 hours. I want that elevated in my system before I go into surgery. And then I'll just keep those elevated levels for myself through the duration of like healing or whatever to see how quickly I can heal. And I might actually make it into a series to see like, hey, the doctor says that normally you heal from this type of surgery within six weeks. Let's see if we can cut that in half or that might be an interesting experiment for people to actually go through. That would be. All right, we got another question there. Bean D, can you speak on heart health, specifically arrhythmia, uh, i.e. getting rid of it without medical procedure or conventional pharmaceuticals? Uh, let's actually just, unless one of you guys knows off the top of the head, I am not familiar with what arrhythmia is, so I'm going to. So this. it's basically irregular heart rate, right, if I understand that correctly. Um, if it's related to the recent um, mandated pharmaceuticals, I don't know that there is a cure. Um, if it's something else causing the arrhythmia, um, I can't really speak to heart health that much. I do think, though, and it would be worth you guys looking online yourselves, I think that there was a study uh, you shared with me, Sam, on PPC, and it talked about how it helped with arrhythmia. So that might be something to look into. Uh, I don't have it pulled up here. Actually, I might have it pulled up here. I'll share this link over here in the comments. I don't know if you guys can see it. Okay, here we go. Um, uh, I will. I just shared the 
pulled this study up. So this way we can, you can keep your share of it and that way we can get through the questions and I'll pull up that study or I think this is the study. I, I got it there, Sam. In the this one, is it this one here? Yep. Okay, so this is from 2016. Um, I think, was this the one we talked about the other day, potentially? Mm -hmm. It is, yeah. Um, and arrhythmias. And arrhythm arrhythmias, right? So if you look down here, BPC completely eliminated hypercalamia, which I think is, what is that, related to uh, blood sugar levels? Or, I don't know. And arrhythmias, marked, attenuated, or attenuated is a fancy fucking word for saying like reduced the effect of something and er eradicated or like gotten rid of behavior, agitation, uh, muscle twitches, motionless resting and completely eliminated post whatever that word is, uh, hyper allegation. So BPC did help with this. Um, this is a review. So you can Google literally just Google this. Uh, you'll be able to pull this up. And if you click on the link, I think it actually redirects to the entire paper. Yes, it does. So you can go through and read the entire paper and dive in deeper on their beam. Beam, I would personally go that route. And Brian also shared it, the link uh, for the study in the chat there if you guys want to check it out. All right, so next question. Who has the best SARMs? Um, you guys, so I've got it kind of broken down. I've done this a few times on my page uh, or on videos. And then if you guys go to my Celestio page that I've always talked about, that's constantly updated by who I think has the best. Uh, and you guys are welcome to chime in here too, Sam and Seth. Uh, I think as far as quality goes, uh, Kimio has always been up there at the top, right? They're kind of like the industry leader. And then there are a bunch of companies. All the companies on my list are really good. But if it depends on what you're looking for. If you're looking for an injectable, then Unchained is going to be about the only ones that carry injectables, right? So it depends on what specifically you're looking for. If you want a liquid that isn't going to make you gag, then Champion Labs has, you know, something in there so it doesn't make you want to gag and <laughs> sweetener or something right um if you're wanting capsules then probably swiss kim's has the biggest variety and so on and so forth so it really depends on what you're looking for liquid capsule injectable and if you're looking for a liquid do you need it to be you know less potent tasting or not <laughs> also you can go check out american farms too right brian that's a new company coming up yeah so um I'm working with Unchained to launch American SARMs. That was supposed to be up last week, having issues like always with websites and card processing and all that kind of stuff. So that's in the process. The website is online. You guys just can't order yet. So that's going to be a combination of liquids, capsules, and injectables on there. There's also going to be some topicals coming out with peptides. Yes. Um, uh, Joe V asks a question here. S23 versus Anavar. Similarities. Excuse me. And what do you prefer, uh, Brian or, or Seth? What do you guys What do you guys think? I have some thoughts on this, but let's hear from you guys first. Go ahead, Seth. Um, honestly, then I'm not telling you guys to do this whatsoever. Um, just from my own research, I've I've taken both. Um, they're both great. Just depends on your goals. So I mean, just try them out and see what works for you. That's what I would say. I mean. Just do your own research. They both work great. They both have different side effects and they both have different benefits. So like basically just researching them on your own self and kind of just seeing what works for your, your body. So I think that um, the biggest issue in comparing the two is the quality of the Anavar that you would get oh, because getting legitimate, good quality Anavar is very hard, right? If you're not getting it straight from a legitimate pharmacy, there's a good chance that it's actually Winstrol. So you, it's kind of hard to say, okay, well, I took Anavar, and you know, in comparison, this was better than that because Winstrol is, generally speaking, a much better muscle building compound than Anavar would be, right? So unless you know that you're getting legitimate Anavar, it's kind of hard to compare the two. I haven't run S23 long enough to really compare the two, um, simply because of you know it was designed to be a male birth control, so. I don't want to have any of the side effects related to that. Even though I am on TRT, it's something I've kind of avoided. Maybe that's something I should look into trying out a little bit longer. But I do love Anavar when it's legitimate. I uh, I want to answer this question, but also this is for Brian to, to think about and give me. Uh, this is for Sam personally. Uh, so I did this firm test and came back below what is normal. Uh, I'd like a thought on one or two things that I can start to implement before testing again. But before you get into that, Joe, um, Anavar and S23 or Anavar and RAD, RAD 140, 
in my experience, have tested all of them many times. Um, and I think that they're very similar in a lot of different ways. And it depends on like the individual assessment that Seth was saying, but also the, the dose, right? So certain things say like S23, like a common dose might be say five or 10 milligrams a day, right? But somebody taking Innovar might take 50 milligrams a day. So you're like, hmm, well, like, is it really more effective or stronger or is it just because you're taking 5X the dose, right? Uh, so like, that's something to play around with. I, I like both as a pre-workout, right? Like I don't, as I mentioned earlier, I haven't taken anything in you know three months. I just upped my testosterone slightly. Uh, I still use things for HGH and I'm using AOD, but like, I'm not, you know, I'm not testing out either one of those. I, I would go with Anabar or uh, S23 over RAD. I'm not necessarily a big fan of RAD. Really appreciate the stacking guide, by the way, from Brian. Hey, thanks, Thank Brian. You, <laughs> Thank you. Glad you guys like that. I'm actually working to redo that. Um, Start working on it a couple of weeks ago, and it should be up soon on the website. It's going to have the cool looking little new uh, cover on it. It's going to be laid out better. Some of the spelling errors will be fixed, et cetera. And guys, if you guys go, I was going to say, if, if you guys need TRT pretty soon, Triggered Medical will be up and running in the next month or so. So Sam can explain a little about, about so that. We'll, have, we'll have, finally have like a source that we can be like, okay, because how many times, Brian or, or Seth, do you guys get people DMing you or asking you about sources for testosterone? Well, we'll finally be able to have a source that we trust, that we can actually tell you like, hey, we're using this to get testosterone. If you want Anavar, you want DECA, you want peptides, you want all that shit. And it's not just like you got to pick it. You actually have to go through a doctor. You need to get your blood work done. So you can travel with this stuff. We'll solve all those issues. And it's uh, a very, very great value uh, out there. But we'll have a lot more information as we move forward. We're in the process. I think we're probably registered in you know a decent portion of the states already. And we're working through the rest of them. So hopefully in the next one to three months or so, we should have uh, something that we can launch or talk about in, in far more far more detail. So that, that's exciting. Yeah. You want to go through one more of these questions uh, before yeah, we wrap it up? Got, yeah. Time for one more and that'll be it. Hey, if you guys, if you guys like this, um, check out my Instagram at sam.stolt or some of these other, um, you know, Brian, you have your stuff listed there. Brian's is probably going to be linked down below. Seth, uh, you can find it is, do you, are you doing by the question? Sorry to, before we get into this is, um, Seth's or my stuff down below just to tell people. Um, so uh, it, I, I, this is my first time doing one of these lives and I didn't see a place to put that in really. Um, so we might have to talk after this, Sam, on how to do that. Cool. Oh yeah. yeah, hundred percent. This is the beginning. So we're actually going to, we're going to release this as a podcast too, I believe. Right. Yeah. So we're going to start doing one of these every week for an hour. And then, like I said, at the beginning, it's going to bro get broken down by question into individual videos that we'll have on our YouTube channels, et cetera. But this full length episode will be available on YouTube and the audio is going to get uploaded to uh, Spotify. So it's going to be available as a podcast. Spotify. If you use the anchor app, Spotify, Apple, and Google, if you're using that. Okay, let's yeah. pull up this last question. So I've been getting a lot of this recently. For someone that's moderate to relatively advanced in terms of cycles under their belt, what's a good YK dosage? Assuming the pairing, assuming pairing it with rad, six, uh, eight to ten weeks. Uh, I've done, uh, and then I'll just let you guys answer. What do you, what do you think? How what's a good dose? and maybe a time or something to pair it with for YK11? So YK, generally speaking, the upper end of the dose would be 10 milligrams a day, right? Or maybe 15 if you really want to go extreme. Uh, for me, I mean, 8 to 10 milligrams a day is definitely enough, um, especially when it's an injectable format. When I did injectable YK, the highest I went to it was very. It was only for maybe like a week or four days or something. Was fifty milligrams a day. So, so I'm not saying anybody should definitely not do that, right? But um, 
at that dose of injectable YK, it was pretty effing crazy to go yeah. really like I felt awesome. Uh, but then again, you the idea is you could run into you know issues where your ligaments and or tendons are not keeping pace with the strength of your muscles and run into issues like that. So if I was going to take YK and I wanted to test out different dosages, I might do something where it was like, okay, cool. I would like to utilize YK and I want to maybe say do it over 12 or 16 weeks, or as Brian talked about earlier, throughout, not throughout the whole year. Right. But what I'm going to only do is I'm going to do it for one week a month. I'm going to do 150 milligrams that week, right? And I'll do like Monday 50, uh, Wednesday 50, and Friday 50 or something, or Monday, Wednesday, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday. So it builds up a little bit for the workouts on Thursday and Friday in my system. And then for the next three weeks, you have off, right? So it's completely out of your system. And then on, you know, the first of the following month, if that's a Monday, right? Do it again, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday. And then for the rest of the month, it's out of your system. That might be how I would approach it. I'm not saying that's the right way or wrong way, but like, when I got to that 50 milligrams, I was like, oh, wow, this is, this is pretty fucking crazy. And I'll, here's, here's another thing I want to chime in, too. I, I had someone talk to me about this the other day. Their joints are all messed up, and they were only using, like, 10 milligrams. I think they were kind of coming towards their four-week mark. Um, so the way I've done it was utilize YK11 for four weeks, and use it only at nighttime because you release myostain during the night more than anything. So um, either before a workout or at night before bed, I would I would dose it very little milligram per milligram. So like you could do like 10 at max and then kind of see what works for you. So like, you know, like we said, or with NK or whatever other, um, you know, supplement you guys are researching with, find that dosage in the sweet spot for you what works good and then you can kind of taper down if you're running into side effects and mitigate those side effects so you could avoid it the next time you're using it so you kind of learn like what works for your yourself like you know one dose might work differently for brian or sam and one might work differently for me so kind of just play around with the dosages and just kind of see what works for yourself because everyone responds differently 100 definitely uh, you want to wrap us up? Uh, you want me to wrap us up or whatever? It doesn't matter. Yeah, we're gonna have to wrap this up. We're in into an hour, and so I think that's as long as we want to go on the <laughs> podcast side of things. So, thank you guys very much for watching this and supporting all three of our channels. Uh, we appreciate the support and the comments, questions, etc. We're gonna be trying to do this, like I said, every week. I've got like forty slides of these questions waiting to be answered. <laughs> so, yeah, we're gonna like three or four of them. <laughs> yeah. So we're gonna try to get other guys on this podcast too, and uh, hopefully get pretty good conversations going around some of this stuff and uh, make sure you guys go to the video description um, when this gets posted on YouTube um, and go into the description there and there are links for each of us. That are and I wonder if there's a way to bring these guys in, if they want to actually come on the cast and if we could answer the question with them actually, you know, coming so, to us. So. so also there's a, uh, uh, maybe screenshot this one too. So if we can use it in other ones, uh, but there is a, I'll take a screenshot right now. Yeah, thanks. Yeah, there is a I completely forgot what I was going to say, but uh, what are people going to look for if they're looking this for this on the podcast? What's what do you want to call it? Uh, it's going to be the the dad bod to fit, and I can share a link when I post this video as an actual this live as an actual video on my YouTube channel. I'll have that in there. I'll send you guys a link too, so you can share it. Cool, awesome, and uh, appreciate you guys. I appreciate both Seth and Brian, but also everybody who tuned in in the chat. Hope to see you guys on Instagram or on, on YouTube, and we'll talk to you guys soon. Thanks. Take care, guys. Thanks.